So uh, heading into the next panel, I'd like to invite up our moderator, Dr. Nadia Abu Zahra. Uh, Dr. Nadia. She has so many accomplishments, it's really hard to get them all in. But just by way of a basic uh, introduction, she's the Associate Professor of International Development and Global Studies and a member of the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa. She researches and teaches on social movements, human rights, ethics, international development, and particularly mobility, immigration, refugees, family class immigration, youth, and community resilience, and has been part of so many projects to help refugees here and back in the Middle East. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nadia. If I may invite the members of the first panel to come sit at your seats, I'd be grateful. I'll steal the middle chair, how's that? So as they're coming up, I will introduce them one by one. Um, so I'll go through all of the introductions and then um, we'll hear from each of the panelists for a few moments, five minutes or so each. And then if there is time, um, because I know coffee is at 11 and coffee must be at 11. <laughs> I hear the yes in the audience. Then we'd have a very short question discussion period, but then immediately we'd open up um, within a few minutes to questions from you. So if you can prepare them from now, think hard on what your questions will be. These are the people with the answers. Oh, that's, uh, that's overdoing it, but if you have questions, this is the moment to be asking them questions specifically about higher education. But also some of our panelists have expertise that goes a bit beyond higher education, the connection between higher education, secondary education. So if you have questions about the role of education and particularly about new ideas, new initiatives, put those questions pen to paper and then ask them, be ready with those hands and ask them right away after. In the question and answer, we'll take a few questions at a time and then have answers from the panel and then go for another round and so on until 11 o'clock when people are clamoring with their coffee cups on the table saying we need. Um, so I'll go from right, my right, your left, my right to, uh, from right to left. Arabic language goes that way. <laughs> so, okay, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting that I am not taller than five foot three. Professor Gavin Brockett is Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Learning and Associate Professor of Middle East and Islamic History at Wilfrid Laurier University. He gained his degrees, uh, a doctoral training as a historian in the Interdisciplinary Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. And prior to Chicago, he was at Simon Fraser University and the University of Victoria. Hands up if you would move from Victoria to Chicago, that's impressive. He is the faculty advisor for a student-led initiative begun in 2013 called International Students Overcoming War. Now, you'll note that they are one of the four workshops that will take place later this afternoon. So just a little note to link Dr. Gavin Brockett with the initiative International Students Overcoming War in that possible workshop. And the, the theme that Mayor Tory spoke so much about of, of citizen activism is a theme that's carried by that group, International Students Overcoming War, who not only think about scholarships, but also about student engagement. So it's that student to student peer support that is, um, and not just support, and that's the interesting part, is that it's, it's the idea that we can learn from one another. So moving along, Ms. Mas Masa Mufti Hamwi, it has not one, but two master's degrees, one in French literature from the Catholic University of Washington, DC, and one in education policies and leadership from the American University of Beirut. She is an expert in education management and reform, emergency education, she's a trained, certified trainer in education in emergencies, as well as interactive and museum-based learning and citizenship education. She has worked for the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia as a consultant and in other various education initiatives in the United States, Lebanon and Syria. 
So she comes to us internationally today. I hope the time change is all right. And she currently not only is the co-founder, but also the chair of the Sunbala Group for Education and Development. So Sunbala operates, it's a non-governmental organization, and it operates in Lebanon, which as you know, hosts millions of refugees to the point where if you take all refugees combined together, you pretty much have a one in three population in Lebanon of refugees. Moving just to my left here, so slightly to your right, is Ms. Ru'a Al Qadi. She's a biochemical engineering student at Ryerson University, born in, born in Sweda, raised in Damascus, Syria. Her undergraduate, Siri, her undergraduate studies were begun in Syria, but were interrupted due to war. She fled to the United States and said hello to the university fees and said goodbye and came to Canada and was offered a Jasur scholarship and is now studying biochemical engineering at Ryerson University. Um, so I'm very, very excited to hear about that component of higher education. And moving to my far left is Ms. Catherine Miller who is the Global Education in Emergency Specialist for the Institute of International Education's Platform for Education in Emergencies Response Program. I cannot imagine what your business card looks like. It must be this long. <laughs> and a graduate of Tufts University with a bachelor's degree in English. She also completed a master's degree in social work at the University of Southern Maine. And get ready for this. This is the exciting part. She specialized in clinical social work with a focus on trauma therapy with refugees. She began work at the Institute of International Education as a finance and operations manager in 2014 before her current position. So that is our panel. Without further ado, I, I think, do you all have more questions? Yes. So if, I, if you don't mind, I'll invite you to speak from your seat. Professor Brockett, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you all for coming and to Jusur for organizing this. I have been, had the privilege of working with Jusur, with Lean in particular, and Maya and Christina for the last almost two years. And so when I heard that the conference was going to be held in Toronto this year, I thought, well, this is an opportunity too good to pass up on because I've followed the conferences that you've been having uh, in other cities and wish that we could participate. And I have the privilege of coming here today with, with three carloads of students uh, who are in, in your midst today. Uh, ten of them are students who are sponsored by JUSUR and by Wilfrid Laurier University, where I work, uh, through the International Students Overcoming War Initiative. And four of them are student leaders from that initiative who will be presenting later on. So it's a real honor to be here because uh, it wouldn't be but for them and but for JUSUR that I would be sitting here. And uh, so thank you for that opportunity. We've been asked to talk uh, a little bit about higher education and social integration for newcomers. Uh, and there are many ways of tackling this. And I'm sure that uh, this discussion will be very fruitful because we have representatives from very different perspectives. And I hope that we can really generate some ideas and some answers to, to some of the questions that we know we face. Something I want to begin with, though, uh, is just to really make a couple of definitions for the conversation before we go too far. Because the conference has focused in its title and it's in the language that's been uh, advertising the conference, is the word refugee has, has come into play. And I think uh, this word is, is so much more complicated than we tend to, to think. And the students that I brought here today, for example, the 10 Syrian young women, none of them would consider themselves refugees. They are in Canada as international students. And that has been one of the uh, ideal aspects of the program through which they've come is that they didn't have to wait to be accepted to Canada as refugees. As we all know, that process can take many, many years. They were able to apply for student visas and to come here very quickly, really, uh, to be students in Canada. And whatever different uh, preconceptions or ideas you might attach to the word refugee, I think the most important thing to remember is that some, a refugee is someone who simply has made a choice to leave, to flee conflict and violence because of the risk that it poses them or their family. It could be any of us in this room were something to happen in Toronto or Canada, and we could find ourselves in equally very difficult circumstances. 
someone who's a refugee come, could come from many, many different social and economic backgrounds. I could be a refugee as an academic. I could be out of my work. I could be simply needing to find food and shelter in another part of the world. And in Kitchener-Waterloo, where I come from, which is about an hour west of here, uh, we have received somewhere in the range of 2,000 Syrians um, who were put there by government uh, or sponsored by private sponsorship. And then we've had another uh, undetermined number of people who've actually moved to Kitchener-Waterloo from Toronto, from, Waterloo, uh, from Montreal for their own reasons. And one of the distinctive features of the families that I've interacted with is that most of them have come from rural backgrounds. Uh, most of them probably haven't even finished what we would consider grade 12 in high school let alone thinking of going on to university. And so when we talk about integration of refugees or newcomers to Canada, we need to think of different levels of educational preparation and what their plans were even before they came to Canada. So we have the privilege of having 10 students who speak English fluently, who came, who are planning on education, post-secondary education, who've come to Laurier to study with us. But we also have thousands, as in Toronto, of, uh, of young women, young men, for whom post-secondary education is something that they really don't necessarily understand what it is or where it can lead. They're now integrating into the school system where they're being told that post-secondary education is the future, uh, but we need to help them do that. The second point I'd like to make is that when we talk about higher education, we're not simply talking about universities. Uh, universities, of course, dominate uh, our conversation about post-secondary education but there is a very large, very healthy network of community colleges that provide very fine education to students. And university is not the only path, and I think it's important that this conversation not be limited to university. Uh, and that especially for those people, for example, if you think of the young families that have come from Syria, where the, the husband may only be 23, 24, 25, the chances, the opportunity cost for him to stop and go to university to take on an education that would be minimum of four years are probably far too high. Whereas a community college may offer a program that will help him or her move into a field of employment much more quickly. And so that, that part of the conversation is important. Universities, uh, I would say, are probably the largest public institutions in any city. If you stop and think about the number of people that are involved in a university. At Laurier, we're what we would call ourselves a small to middle-sized university with about 15,000 students. But down the road from us is a much larger University of Waterloo with 35,000 students. And then all the employees on top of that uh, and the staff and the faculty that, that make these numbers very, very large institutions in any one urban setting. And I want to point that out because it means that we have tremendous capacity in our cities to make a difference. Uh, universities are populated by people who are generally socially conscious and committed to making a difference in the classroom and beyond the classroom. And universities have a history of doing this. The, some of you will be familiar with the World University Services Canada, WUSC as it's sometimes known, and I know that there are some students here who've come through WUSC today. Uh, WUSC began in the university setting 90 years ago in Canada. And it's a great example of a program that has had a huge impact and uh, that came out of a social consciousness that universities tend to breed. The challenges, though, that universities face uh, revolve around the fact that our cycle is really sort of term to term or year to year at best. And while faculty or students may become very active and committed to a particular program, how do you actually make a university decide that social activism or humanitarianism is a institutional priority. The key here, uh, as Lean can testify to, has to do with this concept of a tuition waiver. How do universities uh, drop the high cost of international student tuition fees or provide tuition, or tuition and or living allowances to students? It's incredibly hard to change a university's direction or to have a university actually decide that that's the path it's going to go down. And perhaps in the conversation today, we'll end up talking a little bit about that. But I'll stop there. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, as Lara said as well, I, this is very emotional for me because um, not only I work with Syrians and I am Syrian, I also um, I consider myself part of the Jusur family. And we're colleagues, we collaborate, we work together. I know everyone on board. I know the team in Lebanon. So it's quite, uh, it's quite touching to be with for me here and participating for the second time, actually. I spoke at Jusur in London conference. And now today I'm in Toronto, and I'm really very happy to be here today. So thank you, Jusur, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Doctor, about what you raised in terms of um, the discussions that we would like to uh, further discuss. And I would like also to highlight our perspective toward the response. How are we responding? really to the crisis of refugees and enrollment and higher education. It's not only the what, but it's, it's really the how. And maybe to set the context, uh, um, we need to remind ourselves of basically some, some issues or some information, the background information. Uh, the estimates of Syrian, ref Syrian enrolling in higher education before the war was 20% only 20% before the war. In 2016, the estimate overall of the enrollment of Syrian refugees, whether in Toronto or everywhere, I mean overall, is 5%. So the scope of the crisis is so disruptive and so huge that we need to ask ourselves, how can we just approach this crisis? The challenges related to the enrollment of our students in higher education are mainly across all uh, countries um, of threefold. Uh, mainly first, it's because of the legal issues, the lack of documentation, restrictive policies. Second, it's the lack of information about procedures of academic and career guidance. So this is really very important, the counseling. And third, of course, the financial shortcoming. But this is not only the only challenge. The, only cha the, the other challenge is that no matter how, ma how many scholarships we offer, again, the scope of the crisis is way too high. We're talking about 120,000 IDPs inside Syria and, how, and above 100,000 refugees uh, uh, eligible to enroll in uh, higher education. So imagine the number of scholarships. Is that the only solution? And the other problem is, when addressing higher education enrollment, is that this, the crisis starts way before higher education. It's, it starts at the most critical, critical age group, which is the secondary age group. So why, how do you do imagine that only 12% of the 40 to 40% 40 children who are enrolled in primary, 12% of them stay or, or retained in secondary education. And that percentage is only dropping. So the crisis really starts at an earlier phase. It's the children in secondary education. How can we ensure that cycle, that continuum, that life journey of education? So we're talking about too many challenges here. So again, my, my question is, do we really have to approach higher education enrollment in the context of crisis in the most conventional way? Like to say, okay, the most natural way is that we want to ensure that children or that the young adults go to higher education because they've had secondary or they have a primary. And again, this is where I really agree with you because we're talking about a series of other alternatives, vocational education, vocation education as an alternative, certified training, community colleges, internship, and so on. Another trend today that is very important is the disruptive, what we call the disruptive solution. Disruption used to be a negative term. Today, believe it or not, it's becoming the positive term. It's like how to really face that caliber of crisis in a disruptive way. And I can say more about disruption. But I want to also move to another point. Uh, education, and not only higher education, I would emphasize on this. Is it for life or is it for work? 
when we're talking about social integration, when we're talking, we're part of this historical moment of, maybe, of making impact and change in the life of students. We need to revise what education is about, to ask ourselves, is it for life or is it for work? Is the role of university to become a job placement agency that ensure that students have all that they need and that they are focused only on the trends and the sectors? Are we moving to a trend where we want to transform all of our children to, to social entrepreneurs or to entrepreneurs? What about those who want to become musicians or writers or nurses or teachers? The reason why I'm asking, because we are following this kind of trend because there's this invasion of the artificial intelligence and automata automation, which is also placing the future of the current jobs at jeopardy. So there's this kind of panic. How are we moving? What do we need to do? And there's so, so much focus to the point it's becoming obsessive on certain skills and we're ignoring so many others. Again, about talking about social integration and higher education. World Economic Forum is one of my favorite uh, platform that provides so many relevant uh, reports and studies have defined the skills into three categories. There are the foundational literacy skills for 21st century, there are the competencies, and there are the character qualities. Most of the trends and the institutions are focusing on foundation literacies and competencies at the expense of the character qualities. And what do I mean by character qualities? Resilience, adaptability, uh, leadership, uh, flexibility, curiosity, and so on. So this takes me to another point. I would like to mention the other side of the trend, something called the IPEN, and it has so many resources for our children and students. It's, it stands for the um, International Positive education network. Why positive education? Because it challenges this conventional paradigm of only focusing on skills and academic goals at the expense of other goals, which are the well-being and the characters. So IPEN, the International Positive Education Networks, believes that the DNA of education is of two strands, academics plus well-being and characters. So this is why I believe when we talk about education integration, social integration, let's not forget what education is about. What kind of learners we want to bring into the, uh, the life and to our communities. And this takes me to my last point, which is what Canada really stands for. In the Human Capital Report issued by uh, the World Economic Forum in 2017, Canada was rated, ranked number 14 in providing the knowledge and the skills necessary for its workforce. Whereas Norway was number one, Finland number two, USA number four, Canada is number 14. But listen to this piece. The other report issued by World Economic Forum on ranking countries that have the best influence, positive influence on the world, Canada was ranked number one. So this is where what education is about. Let's not forget about the values. And as David Perkins mentions in his great book, Future Wise, we need to, edu to educate our children to be that future wise, to become the lifelong learners for the needed a global economy. And also not to forget that why initially the, human ref the Syrian refugees came as refugees to Canada. Let's not forget the reason what brought them here. And to me, keep in mind that education remains a humane endeavor above all. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank Jusur for giving me the opportunity to be a speaker today. Also, I would like to thank you for being here. Uh, we, are all, we, all, we all know that, unfortunately, 
we have striked by one of the most devastating human crises since the Second World War. This crisis is a public displacement, uh, which the scale has rarely been seen before. Luckily for us, some countries like Canada has stepped in to provide help. Um, I believe that this Canadian government, with the generosity of the Canadian people, have proved that a human being is still respected, regardless of their ethnicity, political affiliation, and religion. Of course, I'm referring to the Syrian crisis. For me, and, uh, and as like any youth, being in a university is very essential. So when I first came here, the, fir the first thing that I did is I applied to all the engineering faculties in Toronto with very big hope that I will get in. And I was so excited because I knew that the education system here in Canada is so advanced. But I was not offered a place. I was lost for more, more than nine months. I had no one to seek advice. Um, I, I thought that being in a university here is probably impossible because I'm a newcomer, I'm a refugee. And then I had this very lucky conversation with one of the admission officers at Ryerson. And he looked at my papers and he told me, you just need grade 12 English and you will just get in, just apply in the, in the second year. This conversation has changed my life and I felt like I have hope and I can actually achieve my goals in Canada. Since that day, I've been telling my story to everyone, all the newcomers or the refugees that I've met. I want them to learn and I want them to save time, money and save themselves from being let down in a new country. I believe that refugees or newcomers should not only be welcomed with music and welcome home signs. I believe that there should be counselors that sit with them and view their education uh, background and their employment history and ask them, what is your purpose? And to help them achieve it here in Canada. It's so hard to understand the system here. It's very different than Syria and I believe it's very different than any other country. So giving them guidance will give them purpose and will help them achieve their goals. Also, I believe that education is a very powerful tool to demolish the effect of war. We know that refugees are protection seekers and to be a protection seeker, that means there's a big reason and you have been suffered, that you have suffered a lot to be here and to be a protection seeker. So we have to understand that integration for them is even harder. We, they need guidance and they need help and they need counseling. Uh, giving them a purpose and helping them achieve their goals will also of course, of course, it will help them integrate fast, but will also help them um, in the process of um, uh, not feeling homesick, in the process of being confident in a new country, and also will um, save them from being in a risk of uh, different types of abuse in a new country and being led to a wrong path. I know that Canada uh, prioritizes minorities, and uh, I was thinking maybe if we can prioritize some, um, some stuff for the refugees, for example, to give them uh, scholarships that are only accessible to refugees. Also, uh, maybe research positions or job employments that can only be accessible by refugees. This will minimize the competition for them and they will feel that they have a chance in this country to integrate and they can be part of the society easily. Um, I think in, at this moment we need a tangible act that could actually make them feel that they are that they can be part of the society. Uh, so with the absence of counseling, I think um, a lot of the ambitious and dreams of newcomers can easily be vanished. Um, thank you. Good morning. Um, I would also like to thank Jasor for having uh, myself as well as, as, well as uh, my fellow panelists. Um, it has been an honor um, speaking from the perspective of the Institute of International Education to partner with Jasor on so many projects. So thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to give a quick word. Um, in Earlier this year, actually fall 2016, the Institute of International Education launched uh, what is a mouthful, the Platform for Education in Emergencies Response. This was a project that built off of IIE's Syria Consortium, 
Um, the Syria Consortium still exists. It is a network of over 80 uh, U.S., primarily U.S. institutions that agreed to waive tuition for Syrian students in the U.S. This was no doubt in an effort to make up for the lack of um, governmental um, intervention um, with respect to helping displaced students attend higher education. But the program was a success. Of course, there are new constraints um, politically and so forth um, that have prevented many Syrian students from arriving to the U.S. to attend these higher institutions. For that reason, IIE teamed up with um, the Catalyst Foundation to form PEER. PEER is an effort to connect um, Syrian students in year one to higher institution opportunities around the world. Um, so far, the cornerstone of the project is a database that has over 700 educational opportunities for displaced students. It's been tremendously successful as far as our outreach to these displaced students. There are hundreds of thousands of unique users from all the countries where Syrians are residing. Um, but a word about, a uh, further word about inclusion. Um, forgive me, I have notes here. Um, so I think it goes without saying, and the, my fellow panelists have said it all quite well, so I'll be fairly brief, but social inclusion um, is absolutely important, not just for um, the society in which a displaced student is arriving, but also for the student himself or herself. Um, universities in particular help advance the cultural inclusion um, and socioeconomic socio um, advancement. When a student arrives at a university, and I have um, some background, as um, was mentioned, doing trauma therapy for displaced students at university, I think one of the first things that I learned in that experience was that a Syrian student in particular um, once said to me, you know, one of the best parts of being here is just that I'm not just a refugee. In fact, I don't feel like a refugee. What I am, first and foremost, is a student. I'm a student at university. And so I think while there are myriad benefits to the societies in which and the communities in which our displaced students are settling, I think one of the most important elements of this participation in higher education is absolutely this um, enhanced self-identity and broaden self-identity. Um, I think recently, our, I'm from the US and our Justice Department released interesting statistics, which may not surprise anyone in this room, which is that um, dis, uh, refugees in general, those who have been settled in the US, have contributed to the um, economic advancement in their relative communities. Um, this wasn't exactly announced widely from the current administration. However, um, the, I think that one thing is that it's incredibly important, not just to help a refugee student um, get to university, but I think that it's one of the, um, I think what we need to think about as well is that a lot of students dream of going to college, university. Many of us in this room, if not most of us in this room, also do. And I think many of the displaced students, I know most are no different. One thing we see over and over again when we look at the students who are in the camps, the students who had their higher education interrupted, is that they talk about college or university. They are no different. And I think um, higher education across the globe is growing at enormous rates, and we cannot leave um, the displaced students behind. We cannot relegate them to a secondary education only as we know that when a student knows that higher education is an opportunity, is a possibility, they are more apt, as was mentioned, to finish their secondary education. So I think the two issues are absolutely entwined. Um, and I think I will conclude there. Thank you very much. I'll proceed from sitting, if you don't mind. So we're at 10.26. I once chaired a panel and forgot that my job was actually just to keep time. It was so embarrassing. So now I'm trying to remember, I must keep time. Must. So I'll start with one, possibly two questions, if you don't mind, to the panelists. And then it can go straight to the audience. So I, I, will, I will be as 
quick as I can because I have so much curiosity. I heard a paradox. On one hand, I heard someone on the panel, so Professor Brockett, um, or if you don't mind my going with first names across the panel, uh, Gavin, I heard you say one of the strengths of the Canadian system is that when you arrive on soil, you are, um, you are a Canadian, you are a permanent resident. And so you have access to everything you wish to have, with one exception of voting, which you can get a few years later if, you're, um, if, you, if you wish to have citizenship after. So that truly is a strength, and that's something no one wishes to change. But it raises the big question that I think Ru'a raised, which is that our universities, our colleges, have international offices. And the job of the international office is to orient people to, I don't know, in Toronto, give them subway tokens. Do we still have subway tokens? <laughs> Do you now just scan your phone? I don't know how things are in Toronto. It's been a long time for me. I'm a graduate of Toronto, so I can just tell you where to eat. That's about it. <laughs> so, you know, the international office is there to orient people, to say, you need grade 12 English. You need this. You need that. These are our hoops. This is, <laughs> this is how you jump through them. But the big issue, of course, as you just pointed out, is that a newcomer is not an international student, is not flagged on the system of admissions, and therefore the international office is not approaching you saying, how can we help? How can we orient you? How can we welcome you? So my question to the panel, if you've been thinking about it all this time, is what do you recommend? What do you think? And I see someone pressing her mute button. Sure. Um, I don't know the exact way that we might identify um, a student as having come. Um, I see the paradox you're mentioning. But I will say to answer the question about support, um, I think that as far as inclusion goes, one of the most important ready-made um, benefits is that there's already friends. College promotes friendships. College promotes learning, of course, and so forth. But one thing that's not readily addressed enough is the need for psychosocial support. And I think that universities um, can be better equipped to identify the students who are coming from places of conflict. Um, and another point to consider is that a lot of times a student won't present with psychosocial um, symptoms or somatic symptoms when they first arrive to university but rather once a student is settled in and starts to form that community, many of these symptoms arise, PTSD and so forth. So I think it's not just an initial intervention, but rather something that should be seen over the long term, term over the course of someone's entire education. Uh, I would like to add one thing. It's, it's very pertinent. Your point is extremely pertinent and it's true how to deal with that paradox. And I would like to suggest that part of the mechanism of welcoming Syrian refugees and welcoming them as future citizens, citizen, part of that should integrate in the element of counseling. We shouldn't wait. They shouldn't wait just to go to university. I mean, they could be directed to community college, to certified trainings, to any kind. But counseling should be an integral part of that welcome, of, the, of that kind of mechanism of you know, integrating and helping them to integrate. Yes, there is an international uh, office in the university. But what about those who haven't yet accessed university? What, what, what about those who want to change their career path? But so, so counseling, I couldn't agree more with Rua. Counseling is so a, such a concrete tool to help, and it should be part of the mechanism of welcoming the refugees. Um, I also want to add that I think newcomers, um, any newcomers who are going to be a permanent resident in Canada, if they're above 18, I believe that yeah, there should be counselors that sit with them and have an appointment with them to see and to give them guidance on what to do. Um, it's, it's essential at this time. Nadia, I would, I would say that universities have not done well at this at all. But we, we, as all Canadians, we welcomed 40,000 Syrians when they arrived here. But now, how do we help them move forward? And I don't think that universities are actually very flexible institutions. They are. They're well established, they have big offices, they have people who, are, who know their jobs. And you're right, we have international offices, but those offices are aimed at students coming from abroad, not at the international student population that is here. 
and I know at Laurier, which is a smaller university and a little bit more flexible and, um, and able to respond, even there it's hard for us to orient ourselves towards, for example, how do you uh, address admissions for students who've come from Syria for, for whom uh, access to the documents, for example, may not, be, may, may not be easy. We do actually have here in the room here one of our admissions officers who's working towards making that change. Um, but that's more of a personal mission on his part than an institutional directive. And it is very, very hard to get institutions to pay attention to something like this. My next question shows my, um, I'd like to call it innocence. You may call it ignorance. The word disruptive to me is still like that naughty person at the back of the room. So I need from you, dear panel, some explanation on how this is a positive thing. <laughs> the question. Um, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because the more I try to find solution, the more, it, the more, the more I, I come up and I come across to this term. It's not like I chose to use disruptive. It's so amazing. Like, and then there are synonyms of it, but it's becoming part of the literature almost that we face, especially in handling or addressing the caliber of the crisis in whatever crisis we're talking about. So maybe I could mention a few examples just to uh, explain why disruptive is so important today. Um, for example, someone like Gene Wade, uh, he's based in San Francisco and he's the founder of something called University Now. He's been, he's been considered by the Forbes list as one of the major disruptors, disruptors in, and, uh, 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 in, in the field of education. Of course, the Forbes list mentioned several sectors from finance to health to all kinds of sectors. But I was very much, of course, focusing on education. And Gene Wade, why is his solution considered to be a disruptive solution? This is what he's doing. He's offering online self-based degree without forcing students to take loans. And two characteristics of the university now that distinguishes it, distinguish that university or this solution from other is that not only it has very low fees, but it has also accreditation from associate to up to MBA degrees. So online learning, providing tools, providing concrete tools, and it's just been so successful. It's founded in 2010, so quite recent. So this is a kind of disruptive solution. I would like to mention one of the program that the NGOs in which I run uh, at Sumbula, we created a program called STEM for refugee. While all the education responses today, especially the United Nations ones and all the international NGOs are focusing on basic literacy and numeracy as if refugees only deserve to have basic literacy and numeracy, we at Sombola decided to focus on STEM. And we said, why not STEM for refugees? This program, which was launched in February 2017, this year, made it to the UN Solution Summit just last month, I was giving a talk about it, and it was considered to be a disruptive solution. So what I'm trying to say is that how to bring a fast forward solution that can address the scope of the caliber and it has the scope of the crisis and has mainly the ability to be a scalable solution. That's why it is called disruptive. It's scalable. Nadia, could I give you an example of disruption in the university context, which I think will resonate with you all. Last year, when, when the American government changed its policies uh, with regards to uh, people from Syria and other countries, uh, at our university, we reached a, engaged in a conversation with Jusur as to how we might help and whether we could generate further scholarships to bring students from Syria. And the question at that point was, well, how do we convince a university administration that this should be a priority of the university. How do we actually convince them? And I want to just paint the picture for you that jump ahead in a, another month and a half to sitting in a conference room with the university vice president academic, the one who makes the decisions at the university, the vice president for student affairs, the president ch chose not to be there, I think, because she didn't want to be disrupted, uh, and seven students. Four of them were uh, Laurier's students, Canadian students, 
Three of them were international students through our program, two from Syria, one from Palestine. And they each spoke passionately to the vice presidents about why it was necessary for the university to make this change, why it was necessary to give a tuition waiver. And when it came down to these two Syrian students and the Palestinian student, they just spoke from their hearts. And the two vice presidents and the other individuals in the room just couldn't, couldn't do anything but listen. And when everyone left the room and I was left with the vice presidents, it was clear that at that point they had been disrupted. And the idea that the university's priorities could not include Syrians just was no longer on the table. It still took another month and a half to get them to the point where they were actually willing to make that commitment. But that was a disruption by students who were willing to put themselves out there and force a university to make change. And it can happen. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that universities are starting to consider to prioritize um, refugees and Syrian refugees. Um, I think um, regarding um, asking for um, help and guidance, uh, I think asking people around us for help and guidance is not always very effective because some people can mislead you or have bad experience. Um, so I believe in professional uh, help and uh, professional, putting, um, ha having universities and companies prioritize refugees. Thank you. I'd like to now ask the audience, please, to share all of those questions. I know each of you has a list of 10. So just take that first three and let us know what they are. Yes, OK, all right. All right, I'm going to stand again, because I am not, um, I'm vertically challenged. So I'll start. Just want to check if there are any others. We've got three going well. Okay, we've got seven. Yes, okay. Um, so I'll number you off if you can put your hands up again. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Everyone felt that? Seven. Okay, we'll take seven questions and then hopefully we'll have another round. Good morning. Thank you so much for this wonderful gathering. You know, integration is a two-way street. Of course, having the correct set of institutions is a must if refugees are to successfully integrate it in their society. But I was wondering whether perhaps Rua could share us some thought on, in your opinion, what, what sort of attitude refugees should have if they are to smoothly integrate giving you, you know, your own experience, how they mentally cope with this kind of stress. Do you, do you have any advice in this regard that you can share with us? Thank you. Hello. Um, so I'm going to stand up, if that's OK. Um, so first of all, thank you for your amazing words. Um, I'm really happy to hear that we're talking about like education in general, just because um, my colleagues and I on this table and over here, um, we come from the McGill Syrian Students Association. And uh, so we came all the way from Montreal. Um, and when the refugees first started to come to Canada, we started to get a lot of questions from students that were arriving about how they could apply to university, about uh, how they could, you know, stuff like, fi like finding different grocery stores, taking the metro, very, you know, questions about resources, how to navigate the McGill website. And despite our efforts to reach out to the university to ask, for example, for a workshop um, specifically for refugees to apply to school, we, we never got a response. There was never a uh, active, I think, response from the university to actually assist um, the refugees that were coming. I think the last plane that arrived in Canada was in April, which is way past all sorts of university deadline applications. Um, so, hello. Okay. So we almost became like a, a uh, 
you know, a bridge, you can say, for these students to ask questions instead of like professional counseling, as you were saying. You know, and some people did actually go to the international students' office, to the admissions office, but they didn't find the answers that they wanted, and then they ended up going back to us. So I think in that way, like community is really important, and and access to associations like this is very important. But for us, again, like the issue was that the nature of McGill's very bureaucratic administration prevented us from finding, you know, any sort of connection for students to be able to apply. And then you have like the the difference with schools, for example, like Concordia or Ryerson, so smaller schools where, you know, they were accepting students despite deadlines. Um, they were giving them transfer credits like very quickly. I think, I don't know, my question is either how, how can we encourage these really big, like large scale universities like U of T, like McGill, like UBC to start being active and, and let the, you know, to, to create almost like you were saying, like either counseling um, services specific to these refugees and these newcomers or to waive tuition or, you know, do we do that by being disruptive, by doing, you know, student pressure or, or do we encourage students to just apply to, for example, vocational programs, community college or small universities like Concordia? We weren't and, you know, we are still not able to jump through this super bureaucratic, you know, situation at McGill. So I guess what my question again is like, how, how can we do this? Or what's your advice to doing this? So yeah, that's all. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for all the remarks to all the panelists made. You had such interesting opinions. Um, um, the question I have was about a point that Ms. Massa, you raised about education for life and education for work. And just um, so we're thinking about these prospective students, these new Syrians that have arrived. Um, so they're trying to settle in here. Um, they're trying to figure out their career paths, their educational pathways. And they also have, on the other hand, pressure from parents. Um, we're talking about parents. We grew up in Syria. Um, you know, we had traditional aspirations, those professional jobs, medicine, um, engineering, and all that. So how do we start this dialogue so that um, to guide students, whether they do want to take these like vocational um, educational pathways, online learning, um, uh, to guide all that and basically make these decisions with all these other external variables that are influencing them. Especially since back in Syria, we do have these forms of vocational training. Um, like we like to think of them as informal education. Like when a father teaches them their, their children or their sons carpentry, uh, electricians, um, um, tajar, traders. So like you have that already established in Syria. But then when you come here, parents are, and their families really pressure them to follow these like traditional medicine, engineering, and all that. So how do we start this dialogue? Because we do want to provide these students these opportunities because they are great alternatives to the traditional paths of education. So yeah, thank you. Hello. I'm going to stand up if you don't mind. Um, my name is Tori. I flew in last night from Beirut. And I'm the Jusur's kind of program coordinator for the uh, sort of open access program at the University of America, American University in Beirut, which this semester serves around 100 of the Syrian community members in Beirut for free. And I'm also a graduate student organizer at UC Davis. And so my question is sort of big but strategic, and it comes from those two perspectives. Um, part of what I tr try to do at AUB in the, in the context of my work is to disrupt, not just uh, the question of like, what is education for? Is it for life or is it for residency or is it for work? But also to question what the point of education in general is. So at AUB, it's a pretty racist, pretty colonial space. So part of what me and my Lebanese teachers are trying to reimagine is what that space might look like. What happens when we open it up to students that don't ordinarily get access to it? What happens when we, when we create free opportunities uh, for people who, who, who aren't considered legal in this particular space? And so my question is, um, what would that look like here in Canada? 
right? What would it look like to, to, to reimagine what universities in a colonial space such as Canada for folks who maybe aren't uh, as able to access these spaces, um, what that might look like? And something I haven't heard a lot from, from any of the panelists here, is the role of labor, the role of student labor and student unions. Um, in my work at UC Davis, uh, something that we've struggled to figure out how to do is integrate refugees into the, 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 the formal political uh, union movement. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that, many of which are political, many of which are historical, many of which have a lot to do with fear and how um, uh, a lot of folks who come here as refugees are scared to be involved in politics and because they've been trained in a, cer in a certain way to be apolitical. And so I'm just wondering also in the context of educating here in Canada, what might be done in that effect, to that effect, uh, to engage with Canadian politics more generally, not just to create space for scholarships or for student activities, but to really challenge some of the Canadian policies that prevent certain kinds of Syrians from coming to Canada. Um, Ru'a mentioned that Canadians are welcoming of Syrians of all stripes and all religious and all political persuasions, but I think we all know that's not necessarily the case. That if you're a Syrian that were involved in particular kinds of politics in Syria, you have been denied access here. And so I'm just wondering if there's space for that kind of organizing um, on campus politics. Thank you. while Ibrahim does the long walk across the room to person number four. Going once, going twice. Yeah, or oh, 05, okay, my apologies. Yeah, that's right, I have four questions written down here. So, okay. Hi, uh, thank you very much to, uh, to the panel. Um, I've definitely, uh, sorry, my name is John Carla. I'm the project lead of York University's uh, Syria Response and Refugee Initiative. Uh, we're doing uh, some refugee sponsorship in partnership with the Ryerson University Lifeline Syria Challenge and some promotion of education around refugee issues with our students. Um, f first, I would just like to thank the panel uh, for its recognition, particularly of some of the student activism that has encouraged universities to do the right thing and is a form of disruption. I think that's a message um, that students and the rest of us can take with us is, is the point to stop and make people actually think about these processes going on to do the right thing. Uh, the question I wanted to ask though, um, particularly linked to the, the notion, uh, Gavin, you raised that student visas are actually far faster way of bringing refugees to Canada than um, waiting on government processing. And I think that really stands out. You know, our, the old, our mayor of the city literally uh, can't get his case <laughs> to arrive here in a reasonable processing time. So what I'd like to hear maybe from some of you on the panel is what you see as the barriers and opportunities around student visas uh, to uh, to facilitating access to Canada and to our higher education system for refugees as a potential pathway and solution. She's on? She's on. Okay. Um, she is on, right? All right. So um, my name's Adam. Um, I am a, in the context of this question, I'm a teacher right now. I'm a college instructor in the community college network right now um, at a private community college. Um, and one of the things I've noticed lately is, well, I teach in a stream consisting entirely of international students, entirely of Canadian newcomers. Some um, refugees or would-be refugees among them. And one of the things that I have noticed as well is that quite a few of the adult learners in the community college network in, in and around Toronto um, are people with educations in Syria or in the other regions of the world they've come from, um, but they basically just need to get their accreditation updated, okay? And that's one major reason for um, adult education services being necessary for the refugee population especially. Um, but I want to add, that's the context of 
the question I want to ask, which is, I think, the, a really, really hard question, and one that in a very in a room full of a lot of hope um, is going to land like a ton of bricks on you, which is how do you deal with racist attitudes among people in the post-secondary education system? Um, people who, for various um, reasons of systematic incentives, um, perhaps say they're a private community college, they, uh, there's uh, you know, continual anxiety there among upper administration about maintaining accreditation and therefore maintaining grades. That f tends to foster an era, uh, sorry, an attitude of paranoia about student misconduct to the point where, um, you know, Rua, if, I, if you don't mind my first name, um, the attitude in which many administrators at many um, community colleges in at least the Toronto area, probably throughout the country as well, so part of their attitude towards you if you were an applicant would be not just simply, do you have the proper prerequisites, but how do I know you're not lying to me? How do I know you're not a cheater? How do I know that? And there is a presumption that international students, because they are not, quote unquote, accustomed to the Canadian way of doing things, that they are accustomed to doing things like buying their degrees, like being able to order their teachers around, that, you know, so the result is that many international students face additional roadblocks because of institutionalized and incentivized attitudes that encourage racist treatment of foreign-born and previously foreign-educated students, especially adult students, um, who, you know, need their accreditations to build their careers and build their lives in Canada. And they face these extra barriers because of this presumption and this paranoia that if you are an international student and you are coming to Canada for an accreditation, you're a cheater, you're a liar, you're trying to pull one over on us. And I get this attitude from people a lot. I get it very informally. And it kind of, I'm someone in this room, it disgusts me. But I see it as actually a problem that a lot of people in this room in our very hopeful conversations, we are skating around, which is the fact that many Canadians remain hostile hostile to the people in this room, hostile to people from other countries, and suspicious and paranoid of their intents. And I think the biggest challenge, especially given our political moment, you know, the mayor made a couple of jokes earlier about our more um, bombastic neighbors in political circumstances, but these bombastic neighbors have large followings. They have large followings in Canada. There was going to be a white nationalist demonstration here on September 14th, and the University University of Toronto was good enough to quash it, and the police were good enough to quash it before it could organize. But there are many people who want every non-white, non-Christian person out of this country and consider them cheaters and liars, and many of them work in the education sector. And I'm wondering, um, and many of them are incentivized to hold these attitudes for various different systematic reasons, and I'm wondering... Are there any proposals and ideas that are looking this phenomenon in the face and, you know, are, are aware that this kind of hostility and this hatred actually exists in this country? Hello, everybody. I'm Jana Taifur. I'm a master's student at UFT, and I'm also the I'm representing Toronto Youth Cabinet at Toronto City Hall. So, um, my thank you all panelists for sharing all those insights with us. My question is going to be short. Um, when I heard you speak, I heard elements around equity, accessibility, and even social integration for newcomers slash refugee youth in the Canadian community and Canadian context. I just want to know uh, how can we utilize those three concepts to create a platform for newcomer youth to actually feel they have a voice, that they are respected, and not just stigmatized. Like, I just want to know like, your opinion on, about that, because that's my, I want to know more about it. Thank you. Well, forgive me um, for being the bad person here. We, we will end in four minutes. And so I think the best attitude for us all to 
to live with is that it has been a great pleasure and a great opportunity um, and a great honor to be witness and to have heard those questions. And while you may not get your answers now, you can accost us in the next 15 minutes of the coffee break. So I'd like to give a 30 second, 45 maybe, um, closing for each of the speakers. Okay, well, I'll start. Right, let me just address very briefly some of the questions about institutions here. Uh, there's no doubt that within institutions there are individuals who do hold racist and intolerant attitudes, and the job of our universities and colleges is to make sure that those don't guide decisions. Universities also have to make sure that every student who comes in has the credentials that enable them to study and to perform well at university, and that's what our admissions officers try to do. With regards to uh, student visas, uh, I think the challenge of having someone come with a student visa comes after they graduate, which is where do they go afterwards? Uh, someone who comes in as a refugee um, has a future in Canada. A student on a student visa, we're facing this question now, uh, will they be able to apply for express entry or will they have to go home? And I think that's something, a responsibility we have to take on. Lastly, with regard to how we get make change in universities, the, the scenario I mentioned earlier of four students articulating very clearly to university senior administrators as to why they should make changes, why the institutional priorities should be along the lines of providing tuition waivers, plus three very passionate, articulate young women explaining their own stories did not actually result in change for another two months. It remains for universities to see, to be, to be uh, to under, for us to understand what institutional priorities are and how to drive them. And I think student pressure, faculty and staff all coming together can result in that. But it took us more or less three years to get to that point. Um, so it's not fast. But if you do it, and if you commit yourself to it, you can get there. We did. One, uh, one of the great advantages of being in a conference like this is that the question themselves or this discussion carries a lot of recommendations. Uh, a report that should come out of the conference is like actually the discussions leading to recommendation. Some of your questions are in themselves recommendations. And I hope that you don't take it for granted that you live in a free country. Like, what's the best way to bring your recommendations, I would say, your questions turned into recommendations to make the policy change? You are at a place where you can reach anyone. You can write a blog, you can write an article, you can put together a movement, you can address institution, uh, academic institutions and so on. But I would say that you are in a privileged place where you can make your voice heard and make and ask for these policy changes. So some of your recommendations, like creating a platform, like enhancing the role of the students as being part of the mentors, these are great recommendations. The question that you address specifically about people coming from Syria, having to challenge and how to go into the new uh, career path, this is a great question. Again, look at this privilege and opportunity that you have by coming to a place like Canada. I would say the best, the starting point is to address that new phase in life with a growth mindset, as Carol Dweck calls it. The growth mindset does not limit your opportunities. It allows you to reassess your strength, the weaknesses, and kind of, you know, build on that. No one said because we have limited majors in Syria that you are bound to continue that major if it's not really your path or your passion. So this is a great opportunity. It's just it takes courage and it takes that kind of open mindset to really take advantage of what you have. And I would like to end with by saying that this is an amazing opportunity again to, to develop a more of a, of a disruptive solution as well. Disruptive solution doesn't come necessarily from grassroots level, but they come also from a policy level. And I see this a possibility, a great possibility, when I listen to your question and to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Um, I had some questions referring to me. Um, regarding uh, integration, uh, it's not easy, especially when you are in a country uh, where you don't know what to do and you don't know how to get in the system. Uh, what I'm asking is not, I'm saying, I don't want them to minimize the requirements 
or the universities to give us special acceptance. No, I'm just saying we need some special guidance. Syrian refugees or any newcomer, if they have to take grade 12 English, then they have to take grade 12 English. But if they have um, their um, Syrian um, uh, high school degree um, and it's uh, certified by the Syrian government, um, I think it should be qualified. I cannot talk on behalf of the people who have um, wrong information and their, their, their uh, certified um, ID um, transcript is false. It is also an issue, and if, if I, I think if we have a doubt about that, then they should do high school here again. Because if they don't, they can never succeed in university. Taking grade 12, grade 12 English in an adult city learning center has improved my English, and it helped me to uh, understand what the professors are telling me, and it was very helpful for me. So I think I, I'm not looking to minimize the requirements. I'm just looking for guidance so they don't have to waste nine months just to know what they need. I would like to conclude by addressing the very tough question um, that you pose, sir. I think that one of the issues that I've seen over and over, and in my opinion, is that we speak a lot and we focus on refugee inclusion. We often focus on the refugees themselves and the supports that help those refugees or displaced students. But I think one oversight that happens time and time again is that we don't focus on helping the local community know how to welcome those displaced students or refugees. Um, I think in our country, we're grappling with this on a very big scale. Why has there been such a movement that is more um, exclusive and, and, and maybe even, I'll just say it, white nationalist movement? Um, but I think that there are definitely socioeconomic factors. People feel scared. People don't, uh, and those who are already um, citizens of whichever country feel scared. They don't have the economic resources they used to have. So there's definitely, at least in the U.S., a general feeling of fear and a general feeling of everyone looking around saying, so why is this fear cropping up and why is it making us less inclusive to our neighbors and to those who are coming to our country? So I think one of the first steps is really just looking at not just refugees with compassion and not just telling people that they must also look at refugees with passion, but I think we have to have compassion for those who um, need to learn how to welcome um, newcomers to their country. Thank you. Massa would like to add one more thing and then I'll give the closing note. Yes, I, I have some tips actually I researched and I just wanted to make sure that I do mention them at the end. I can't highlight enough and agree with Rua as well that there are, through the, the readings that I've done also, is that they keep on mentioning the three most obvious skills that still missing, which is language, English in this case, digital education, and life skills. So these are so important to start and to start on a strong foundation. The other thing that it's also an opportunity is to tap on the private sector. Why not address the private sector to offer a special internship program where these people come and they actually get to understand the culture, get acquired the life skills that are so important and get this work experience. So private sector, let's not forget about the role of private sector. Third and last, please check LinkedIn. LinkedIn is doing such an amazing work. They have partnered with World Economic Forum to create an economic opportunity for every single LinkedIn member. They are tracking the job market. They are analyzing the shortages and the demands and the supplies. They are doing amazing studies to monitor and to help members. So LinkedIn is a great tool as well. Thank you. So... I'd like to just wrap up by asking you that if you did have questions prepared, um, to, to use them, to, to ask them of fellow members as well as panelists of the conference uh, during the coffee break and beyond um, into the afternoon and for those of you joining the gala. I want to just mention and reiterate that right after the break we'll be having workshops, but I, I will leave that to our moderator to mention. And so just a last round of applause, please, for Gavin.
for Massa, for Rua, and for Catherine.